Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you're all staying safe, active and healthy during these uncertain times. My name is Carrie Grady Vinson and I'm the Senior Manager of Scientific and Clinical Programs here at Osteoporosis Canada. I have been a registered dietitian for over 30 years working in many diverse roles. Today, I will be your moderator of the webinar, Winter Activities and You. Before we begin, Osteoporosis Canada acknowledges the land that our offices located in Toronto are on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Osteoporosis Canada is the only national organization serving people who have or are at risk for osteoporosis. The organization works to educate, empower, and support individuals and communities in the risk reduction and treatment of osteoporosis. At Osteoporosis Canada, we educate Canadians about bone health, including healthcare professionals and their clients. We are excited about today's presentation as we understand the challenges winter activities can bring. We will be providing general information about winter activities and bone health. It is not our intention to provide individual advice and suggest for more information to talk to your family doctor or a bone fit specialist in your area. If you have questions during the webinar, please remember to click the question and answer button on your screen to submit your questions and we will try to get as many as we can in the time that we have. So without further delay, let's get started. It is my privilege to introduce our speakers. Dr. Caitlin MacArthur is an assistant professor in the School of Physiotherapy at Dalhousie University. She focuses her research on improving the effectiveness of and access to rehabilitation for people living with chronic health conditions across a continuum of care, particularly home and long-term care. Dr. MacArthur works to improve mobility and quality of life of clinically complex older adults, and she is a lead instructor of the continuing education course Bone Fit, hosted by Osteoporosis Canada, which teaches exercise professionals about safe movements, physical activity, and exercise for people with osteoporosis. She is also a member of our Scientific Advisory Council. Sarah Emery has worked in the field of physiotherapy and rehabilitation for 42 years as a bone fit trained therapist and as an individual living with a diagnosis of osteoporosis, Sarah knows the importance of protecting bones while staying fit. Since joining Lifemark Seniors Wellness in 2001, she has advocated for the provision of treatment and exercise programs that always consider the bone health of the individual. And as a physiotherapist, she works to enhance the functional abilities of, indi of individuals as it relates to their completion of activities of daily living, which includes work, sports, and recreational endeavors. And Tina Zebert is a physiotherapy resident and certified exercise physiologist. She received her undergraduate and master's degrees from the University of Waterloo in kinesiology and received her physiotherapy degree from Western. Tina is currently working on her PhD in rehab sciences at Western University and has built her career around teaching exercise to people with osteoporosis, both, re both through research and clinically. Tina has published several studies on exercise and posture in people with osteoporosis. And now, without further ado, I will turn it over to our speakers. Dr. McCarthy, take it away. Great, thanks everybody. All right, I'm just gonna get my screen shared here for you. All right. Okay, so thanks everybody for joining us today. We're really excited to have you here. Just to give you an overview of what we're gonna talk about, uh, we're gonna speak for about 45 minutes and then we want to give an opportunity to answer some questions that you've sent in beforehand. And if we have time, some that come in through the chat. So first, we're just going to talk about the benefit of, of exercise for bone health, some general safety tips that we want you to kind of 
take forward with anything you're really doing. Um, and then some specific tips for, for the following winter activities. Uh, curling, snowshoeing and cross country skiing, skating and downhill skiing, and everybody's favorite winter activity, shoveling our driveways. All right, so first thing we're gonna talk about are the benefits of exercise for bone health. Really what we're trying to do with exercise for bone health is to prevent fractures. So we know we've been successful if you haven't had a fracture. That means we've been uh, successful in our treatment with exercise. How we can prevent fractures is through a couple different ways. The first is through preventing falls. We can do this through engaging in um, mobility and balance exercises, improving our muscle strength and thinking about our posture as we do our activities. The next way we can prevent fractures is through safe movement. And this is particularly important to prevent fractures of the spine or the back. So things like postural alignment, so thinking about your posture throughout the day, um, body mechanics, so how you are moving your body, um, training our back muscles, they're called spinal extensors, they're the ones that hold us upright all day, um, and stretching any muscles that might be tight and holding us in not the best posture. And the last way is uh, prevention of further bone loss. So um, we can prevent fractures by engaging in exercise that help prevent further bone loss. This would be exercise like resistance training, which we'll talk about it in a second. So we're gonna be talking about some physical activities or some sports uh, that you might engage in throughout the winter, um, but there's a, a whole exercise plan that's really important when you have osteoporosis. So we're just talking about one little piece, which is uh, things that get you moving, things that get your heart rate up. But remember that there are other important parts of your exercise routine. The two most important parts are strength training and balance training. Um, these are going to help prevent falls and help prevent that further bone loss, keep you moving throughout your day as well. So this is just uh, a really quick overview. This isn't the purpose of the webinar to go through this in detail, but I just want to point out to you that these uh, are also really important things that you need to do in addition to those things that you really love to do like uh, in the winter weather. So strength training, balance training are really important. And then the other components are aerobic exercise. So that's things like walking or cycling or uh, dancing, those types of things. Spine sparing, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. So keeping good alignment throughout the day. So I'll go through that in some fair detail. And then training your back muscles. So if you want to learn more about those other parts that I just talked about that we're not going to talk about today, um, there's lots of information on Osteoporosis Canada's websites. There's some videos that you can follow along with, or you could locate a bone fit trained instructor, uh, a physiotherapist um, who can give you some really specific advice for you about the best way to start that for yourself. So in terms of activities um, outside kind of a structured exercise, so thinking more about sports and um, things that you like to do outside in nature and things that you do around your house, uh, we can think about um, the safety for people with osteoporosis who haven't had a vertebral fracture or a spine fracture and the safety about the same activities, but if you have had a spine fracture. And this has come out of uh, research that was done in 2014, where um, they kind of surveyed uh, all the experts in the world, well, maybe not all the experts, but many experts in the world uh, about, you know, what is safe and what is not. So if you have osteoporosis, but no vertebral fracture, you should be able to do your daily activities with proper body mechanics in a safe way. So this would be things like loading the dishwasher, loading uh, the laundry, unloading the laundry, shoveling your driveway, those types of things, but making sure that you have proper body mechanics, which we'll give you some tips for in a second. But you may need to modify or avoid high risk activities like skiing or golf. And so we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, and any sort of work-related activities, particularly lifting um, of heavy objects, but even light objects, repetitively, so doing it a lot, it would be really good to get some uh, education and some assessment from a physiotherapist or occupational therapist about this, one who is trained in osteoporosis. 
if you have a vertebral fracture or, or you've had one in the past, you should definitely consider seeing somebody uh, like a physical therapist uh, who can give you some really specific advice for you about how to manage these activities safely, especially if you have um, poor balance or you have some postural changes, maybe you're starting to feel like you're rounding forward a bit um, or you have pain in your, your back or really anywhere in your body. This is where you may need to restrict some of those housekeeping activities to engage in more lighter activities um, and to get help with things um, that might be a little bit more intense. So things like heavy lifting, uh, shoveling, like, like we're gonna talk about today, et cetera. So if you've had a spine fracture, this is where you might wanna get some help um, and get some individualized attention. You also wanna avoid sitting or standing for long periods of time. Um, and you want to intersperse with five to 10 minute periods um, lying in supine, which means lying on your back, because um, this can help unload the, the pressure that kind of goes through the spine when you sit or stand for long periods of time. Um, and so again, if you want more advice about that, that's where I go to somebody who's bone fit trained, um, who can give you some very specific advice on how to do that safely. So let's talk about those body mechanics I was um, just referring to. So what you want to do is you want to limit certain spine movements. So notice I said the word limit, not completely avoid, it's more limit. So obviously you need to move throughout your life. You need to put on your shoes, you need to um, you know, pick something up. So it's more about limiting. So things we want to limit are bending forward and twisting. I'm just gonna put these all up here. And we wanna think about some qualifiers. So Flexion, that's bending forwards or slouching, um, which I'm doing sitting here right now. So I'm going to make sure that I'm not slouching too much while I'm sitting. Rotation, which is twisting. Side bending, so that's kind of bending from one side to the other or any combination of those. And it's not that you can't ever do these mo motions. It's more that we want to limit when we do it repetitively or sustained. So that's doing it over and over and over or holding it for a long period of time. When it's weighted, so if you're holding a weight or something that has weight to it, so a shovel full of snow is an example of uh, something that would be weighted. And range, so going as far as you possibly can, so that'd be like bending forward to touch your toes or twisting to one side as far as you could go. Um, or rapid or forceful. So going really fast or you know, really intensely. So that's where we wanna limit those activities. So how can you do that? So you can do that by practicing spine sparing strategies, which was one of those things that was in that table that I first showed. So spine sparing is basically modifying all the things I just said we want to try to limit. So how can you do this? There's a couple different ways. The first one is called a hip hinge, and it's probably the most important one to learn. You could also do a step to turn, and I'm gonna go through these in a bit more detail in a second. You could avoid lifting or lowering to or from the floor. Going slow and controlled into things like twists and not going to the end of your range of motion. So just twisting you know, a quarter or a half of the way and not going as far as you can. Splitting up loads or weight on either side of the body. So for example, in this picture here, this person is carrying two grocery bags. Instead of carrying them on one side, they've split them up and car are carrying them on one on either side so that they're balanced. So if you put them all in one side, that side has to work a lot harder to hold you upright. If you do have to bend forward or flex, you could support your trunk, like putting your hand on a table or a chair or on your own knee so that you have some support. And then holding something close, if you have to hold weight, hold it close to your body rather than really far away from you. Then your back muscles don't have to work as hard. So here's an example of a hip hinge and what that looks like. So basically a hip hinge is making sure that when you bend forward, you're bending at your hips rather than at your spine. So rather than rounding forward and curving your spine, when you bend forward, the bend happens right where your, your hips crease. So your hips are where if you are standing on one foot or you're standing up and you lift one foot up, you get a crease in your pants. 
that's where your hips are. So you wanna to try to bend there. So you can see when this person bends at their hips, their spine actually stays nice and straight. And so we call it a hip hinge. And you can practice this hip hinge in many different activities. And actually uh, you'll see that as we go through this. But one example is when you tie your shoe, rather than rounding forward and reaching forward and rounding your back, you can do uh, the same thing, tie your shoe, but bend forward at your hips. Or if you have to pick something up from the floor, rather than rounding forward to pick it up, bend at your hips so that you, you spare your spine, and keep it nice and safe. So I just wanna talk a little bit about how you should interpret what we're talking about today, because we're gonna talk about some risky activities. So as I said before, um, if you've had a vertebral fracture, um, this is where you really want to get some individualized advice about what's safe for you. So some of the activities we're gonna talk about today are risky and could have a high risk for fracture. So you need to know that upfront um, and really you should uh, get some individualized advice. Um, if this is an activity you used to do, maybe, um, or you, you still have been doing, um, we are giving you tips on how to continue to do it safely. So if, some, if skating was something you did, maybe you were a figure skater or a hockey player, um, then we're giving you advice on how to continue to do that safely. We're not saying skating is something you should pick up or start doing, but this is how you could continue to do the, that activity safely. Um, if you're uncertain uh, about anything or you want some individualized advice, you should definitely consult with somebody, a physiotherapist, um, ideally who is bone fit trained and has some experience working with people with osteoporosis about your individual risk level and what's best for you and weighing out the risks and benefits of doing the activity. If it's something you love to do, maybe it's something you could keep doing with some modifications. So through all of the sports and all of the activities we're going to talk about today, just keep those things in your mind as we go through it. And Sarah and Tina will, will kind of point those things out for you as we go, go along. All right. So the first thing, oh, sorry, one more thing. Then we're going on to our first activity. In general, when we think about any activity, these are some things you can think about for safety. So transitions. So sometimes it's not actually the activity that's a problem. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not. It's how you transition in and out of things. So for example, how do you get on your shoes or get off your shoes or get other parts of gear on and off? How do you pick up your or load your gear? So if you have a bag, how are you picking that up? And how are you carrying it? How are you putting it in your trunk? And how are you going to get in and out of more riskier positions? And you'll see what I mean when we talk about curling, for example. <clears throat> you also want to think about the risk of falling. So remember, exercise is one thing can, that can help us not fall. But sometimes exercise and, and physical activity and sports like we're going to talk about today can put you in a position where you're more likely to fall because of ice or tripping hazards or whatever it might be. So think about, could you add some external support? So can you add poles or something to hold on to to prevent a fall? Can you go slower so you're not going really fast and at risk of falling because of that? Maybe avoiding times when novices who do that activity are doing it. So people who are new to the sports, maybe they don't know quite how to move properly or what have you. Um, trying to avoid ice. Now that might not be realistic if you're doing something like skating, because obviously you need to be on ice or uh, curling, for example. Um, but where possible, could you avoid it? And thinking about your footwear is also really important to help prevent slipping. So all of these things are going to be brought up for each of the activities we're going to talk about. And now I'm going to hand it over to Sarah, who's going to talk about curling. Oh, you're muted, Sarah. Hi everyone, good to be speaking with you today about uh, just some activities that I engage in uh, as a, because I'm a physiotherapist, but I'm also an individual living with osteoporosis. So I fall in your camp. So when I look at curling, I mean, it's, it, it's a fun sport to do. As uh, Caitlin just mentioned, we do it on ice. So ways to stay safe, obviously um, wearing proper curling footwear. You know, you can either put on the shoe gripper or you can buy shoes that actually have the grips on them. 
using the adaptive equipment. So I do have a launch pole or what they call a delivery stick for uh, moving the uh, curling stone down the ice. I also have a stabilizer that I use um, if I do get into the hack. So the stabilizer just keeps me from falling to one side, you know, in terms of if I do lose my balance. So there's all kinds of equipment. And you'll notice in that little chart that talks about proper posture under step two, you really, you know, when you are the sweeper, you really want to make sure that you stay stabilized in regards to what's the position of your spine, because we're always talking about spine sparing. So I'm just going to get Caitlin to do the next piece for me here. It's a little video. Growing uh, uh, world, you know, basically you would get down in the hack and you would get into position and sometimes that your hips and your knees can't take that position to get into the hack. So in the, in the curling world, they basically designed a longer extension pole where you can actually remain standing while you push that curling rock down the ice. And the other aspect of curling is, is they've extended the broom handle. So Caitlin's now using the, using the broom, she's in good position. You'll notice that she's keeping her spine in really good alignment because she's using a hip hinge to be able to hold that broom, holding it possibly a little higher, right? When she's doing her sweeping, right? She's gripping that. So again, she's still in that hip hinge position and can still do the sweeping to protect herself while she's, uh, while she's doing the curling. Right. Now, for those of you that want to get into a hack, there's a different tool that you can use and I'm going to show you that. In, in the curling, um, who still can get down into the hack and throw a rock um, but they're finding it hard to stabilize you know in terms of their body um, the curling the curling world has invented a stabilization broom or what we call handle to allow you to get into the hack and slide down the ice right so Caitlin's just going to get down she's in her hack position she's got the curling rock so you'll notice that on her she's left-handed that on her right side, she's very stable and she can basically pick that rock up to throw it and curl it and still have that stability as she slides down the ice. And again, for myself, I'm trying not to twist. I'm trying to stay in good position while I basically use the broom, which has a longer handle. So if I needed to, I could stay up taller and then basically protect that spine. I'll just say that those videos were filmed pre-pandemic, so that's why we're not we're not wearing masks. And my hair was longer, and Sarah's hair was shorter. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I mean, basically, the video. I know the the uh, audio wasn't very good, but I said the same thing in terms of just spine sparing positions, using that stabilizer bar, uh, making sure that you have an extender pole that you can use to launch the stone, and that keeps you in a better position. And footwear. What you do not want to do is fall on ice, right? And it's the same thing with snowshoeing, right? Snowshoeing, one of the best things we can do for our osteoporotic bones is weight bear on them. And the best way to weight bear is stand up and walk. So snowshoeing is a winter activity that basically gets us weight bearing through our bones and walking. But we want to make sure that the snowshoe fits you. Right? There's small, medium, large size uh, snowshoes. So you want to make sure that the snowshoe doesn't become a tripping hazard for yourself. So it's sized for your body height and your foot size. Again, that spine sparing hip hinge. How do you put on that snowshoe? Right? And then how do you use what I use when I snowshoe is I always use my stability poles. So that if I do lose my balance a little bit, I've got poles to stabilize me. The other thing about using poles for stability is it's using the muscles around my mid back and that's doing some strengthening at the same time. So we're just going to show a video. Oh yeah. So, so we're going to, we do we have the video, uh, Caitlin on snowshoeing? Yeah, it's after this. One. Okay. And then just stepping, you know, if you're not wearing snowshoes, moving into winter walking, Gripper shoes are really important. 
So for me, I've got a pair that actually are part of my boot. And then I have a gripper part that I can actually slide over my other winter boots. So making sure that you're wearing proper non-slip footwear, adding grippers, as I said. And when I'm going out for a true long hike, walk in the winter, I bring my stability poles with me. And then we look at cross-country skiing. I haven't done it this year because I live in Kingston, Ontario, and we haven't had much snow, but we've had a lot of ice. And ice and snow mixture for cross-country skiing puts me at risk for falling. But if you're in a good area where you've got a good sound snow base and the trails are groomed for cross-country skiing, go for it. But again, you've got to make sure that the proper length of the ski matches your body height and foot size. The best thing to do in, in terms of being able to put on those cross country skis is use kick on bindings. Mine are easy. I just stick my toe in and put my heel down and I'm locked in place, which is really good. If you do have to reach down to adjust your binding, spine sparing hip hinge posture. We already showed you how to do that at the beginning. We still want you to do it, use it all the time. And then again, there's those poles. So I use poles for walking. I use poles for snowshoeing and I use the same poles for cross country skiing and they keep me safe and stable. And I love cross country skiing when I can get out there where it's not too slippery and too icy because of all the muscles that it uses. And we want to use strengthening exercises throughout the winter. All right, maybe Sarah, if you mute yourself, let's see if that helps with the audio this time. So winter sports, you know, one of the things I love to do is walk. And you know, in the winter time, you gotta make sure that you stay safe when you're walking. So the first thing I do is I make sure I wear a really good pair of boots that have really good tread. You know, you could always put on clamp-ons as well to protect yourself. And then the other thing I do is I, I use poles when I go for a walk. You know, they're snow, they've got the snow thing on them so that I can basically walk safely. And I, I don't put my hands in, in the loops because I want to protect my wrists if I do fall. And then I'm ready to go for a walk in the snow. So snowshoeing is a really good winter sport and I love doing it. But I also have osteoporosis. So I have to think about how am I going to put on my snowshoes while protecting my spine. And this is called spine sparing techniques. So I've got myself sitting on a bench, which allows me to hip hinge. It allows me to keep my spine nice and straight and I'm not twisting and I can still reach down and put on my snowshoe. So I've got the straps opened up a little bit so I can get my foot in there easy, or easier. It's still a little awkward, but that's okay. So I've got it in there. I've got that the back strap in. You notice I'm trying to keep my, I'm doing that hip hinge. I'm trying to keep my spine straight. And once I've got it, I can tighten up my straps, right? Tuck them in so they're safe, right? And then from there, basically, now because I'm sitting on a bench, I can get up and use my strength. I can get up and use that good technique, keep myself straight. And now I'm ready to go out for a day of snowshoeing. I've got my other gear on, right? And what I'm using for myself, for safety, is I've got my summer poles. I've taken off the feet and now I've got the points. So they're good for snowshoeing, keeping myself in good position. It also keeps me using my muscles in my upper body, which is part of the strengthening that we want to do to keep our bones strong. So I'm ready to go for a day of snowshoeing. Yeah, so I just wanted to summarize. So basically what I was showing you, even though you couldn't maybe possibly couldn't hear it, is you notice I kept the hip hinge spine sparing position the whole time when I was putting on my snowshoes, I was using poles for stability, and I was basically using good footwear if I was out in the snow. And I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Tina. Great, thanks so much. Um... So I'm going to reiterate a lot of the points that Caitlin and Sarah had already mentioned. Um, so one of, one of the sports that I wanted to talk about was alpine skiing. So uh, quite different, of course, than cross-country skiing because you get that higher speed associated with it. Um, that being said, it's 
if you're an experienced skier and you kind of already know what you're doing it's a hobby that you've uh, engaged in for quite a while i know for me i was on skis as soon as i could walk so i feel quite comfortable when i get out uh, on the hills um, but if it's something that you're like, oh, I've never tried skiing, maybe maybe right now isn't the time to take it up as a sport, just because it can put you at a higher risk for fracturing just because of that higher velocity. Think about the snow conditions as well. So similar to what Sarah said with their cross country skiing, we know that there's different weather conditions that present different obstacles when it comes to skiing. And so, um, you know, make sure that the snow isn't um, isn't too icy so that you've got a nice condition. Sometimes that sticky packing snow is also really challenging because the skis can sort of stop abruptly. Um, and so you just want to make sure that you're in a good weather condition. I would choose hills that were moderate intensity. So avoiding say like the bunny hill, for example, where you've got a lot of people learning how to ski or snowboard where they could risk running into you. And so you wanna be around people that have good control over uh, themselves while they're doing these winter sports. Um, so as well, if you're skiing with a group of people, try to avoid someone who's learning how to snowboard for the first time or learning how to ski for the first time because you definitely don't want them running into you. And, and causing you to fall over about that. Um, when thinking about the transitions, consider, um, you know, even getting onto the chairlift. So try to brace it with your calves, your knees or your thighs before sitting down. So you've got a nice controlled seat. You wanna make sure that you're hip hinging on and off of the chair. And that when you are doing up the bindings on your boots that you're thinking about hip hinging. Skis are nice because you don't have to bend over to put your boot in the ski, you can stand to do that. And then um, I use my poles to unlock the back of the ski as well. Um, so that I'm not bending over to try to unlock the binding when I take my skis off. Be mindful about what you're doing when you're picking your skis up out of the snow. So think about hip hinging, uh, think about how you're loading up the skis. Are you carrying them sort of across maybe both arms where it might be a little more equally distributed? Are you doing over one shoulder that's more not quite as equally distributed? So that might not be a good option. Um, so think about making sure that you follow the principles of hinging at your hips, balancing out the weight sort of equally, and avoiding that repetitive uh, loaded position um, through bending your spine. Um, so I've tried snowboarding one time, and let me tell you, if you're not <laughs> if you're not used to snowboarding, this is not the sport to take up. I felt like my whole spine got rattled in the time that I spent trying to learn how to snowboard, and I quickly retired from that sport. But if you are an experienced snowboarder, and I did work with somebody who was on the snow patrol. And so uh, they provided that first aid on the hill and and they were initially told don't don't go out and snowboard with your new diagnosis of osteoporosis. And we thought, you know what, she's experienced enough. Um, she knew, you know, how to fall safely if she was going to fall, but felt really confident that she wouldn't. Um, and, and so we talked about the principles of hip hinging improving those transitions and the same ideas with skiing where you want to be careful about the hill conditions um, and uh, and making sure that the, the snow conditions are good as well. I think with snowboarding, because you have to get up and down a bit more often than you might be required to with uh, skiing, uh, maybe a bit of extra cushioning around the hips would be good, um, just to try to decrease some of that load around the spine. Um, and then I did bring out a couple of points here. So be mindful about how you're doing up your laces. So like Sarah said, do that hip hinge instead of bending over. Um, try to squat to sit down when you're, um, when you're uh, sitting down. Uh, at the top of the hill to do up your bindings. And when you're taking them off again, think about that hip hinge. Um, and maybe just take some time to practice this at home um, so that you get some time to uh, familiarize yourself with the hip hinge before getting out onto these conditions. Yeah, um, so for skating, 
again, not the best sport to take up. Um, so not only are you on a very slippery surface, but you're on a pretty narrow base of support as well. So it can be quite challenging for your balance. And um, as Caitlin mentioned, we really want to try to avoid that risk of falling. So one suggestion is um, consider wearing that hip protection. So if you are an experienced skater already, um, I would still recommend maybe a bit of extra cushioning around the hips um, in case you do uh, fall. You could also consider using a frame for additional balance. Um, Maybe you want to stick with skates that you're familiar with. So if you've always worn figure skates, stick with figure skates. If you've always worn hockey skates, wear hockey skate skates because they can be a little bit. Um, it can take it take a bit of time to get used to when you're when you're switching that up. In terms of sports, try to avoid any high contact. So uh, play no contact hockey if you're a hockey player. Um, if you were a figure skater, try to avoid doing jumps and things that would increase that um, velocity or increase that risk of falling. And then the same thing where you're trying to avoid being surrounded by novices. So maybe avoid the open skate times or don't be the person that volunteers to supervise children or grandchildren while skating. Make sure you've got somebody else who might be able to help with that. I remember somebody else telling me a story that they were sort of leading the pack with a group of kids in an open skate time. And then one kid pulled down and the whole line fell with them, including the person who was leading the pack. So we've got to be careful that you're not the person leading the pack. We want to make sure that you're staying on your feet um, and you're not risking falling. And of course, as with all of these, we want to think about those transitions. So um, my husband graciously volunteered to be a model so I can show you some videos. So I, I this these don't have audio. So I totally uh, do not expect you to be able to hear it. And I do apologize for the video quality as well, because um, it was on my iPhone and then I transferred it a couple of times. So the quality declined, but I'll talk you through what we're seeing here. So in this first video, it's what not to do. Uh, so you can see he's sort of casually bending over. You can see that big rounded spine, uh, which is okay for somebody maybe in their thirties without osteoporosis, but something we wanna avoid with osteoporosis. And, um, and, and so he's not bringing his foot to him. He's not hinging, he's just kind of, casually putting them on and then he would stand up and walk away. Okay, so to improve that, again, we think about sliding those hips back. He's got a nice hip hinge. He pulled his foot up uh, to meet the skate as he was putting them on. He's kept that nice hip hinge while tying up the skate. We did put a mat underneath the skate and we also added a skate guard to try to reduce the risk of falling while wearing the skate and then walking away. So of course you would wear two skates, um, but we put the skate guard on versus the, the previous video, there was no skate guard on. Um, so just more um, opportunities to reduce the risk of falling. Okay, and then the last one, our favorite activity of them all is snow shoveling. And I'm grateful that this video is a little bit blurry because it was after I sent it that I realized I've got like resting snow face where I'm just like angrily staring at the snow coming down on my face. So snow shoveling is something that I think none of us were able to avoid this winter. Um, in terms of common errors, um, and we'll correct them shortly, make sure you're wearing uh, so uh, improper footwear would be a concern. I know it's happened to me where I get home from work and I'm just still wearing my work boots or my flats and I'm trying to shovel the snow because I just want to pull my car into the driveway. It's not worth it if you've got osteoporosis. It's not worth it otherwise either. I really should put on proper boots. Um, and then we want to make sure that you're not bending through the spine as you're lifting. So we'll show another example of that with the video. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, so commonly people will keep their feet planted and twist to turn to sort of throw the snow away. Um, that's not advised for somebody with osteoporosis. We prefer you step to turn. So take those couple of extra steps. Loading up the shovel too much. So trying again in that effort to be more efficient where you'd really sort of take on a lot of snow all at once. 
maybe not the best strategy. We don't want to try to make that load heavier than you can tolerate. So we'll watch this video to watch all of my mistakes as I'm shoveling the snow. And there wasn't a whole lot of snow this day, so it doesn't look like my shovel's overloaded, but I did the whole line. You can tell that I sort of twist to turn, so my feet didn't move as I was turning. When I get to the end, I really bend through the top of my back as I lift it up the snow. And if there was more snow, maybe I would have shown you that I did the entire driveway in record time, took no breaks at all. Okay, so to improve that for somebody with osteoporosis, you want to make sure that you're wearing non slip and secure shoes So something with nice grip. And uh, you can use the strategies that Sarah was talking about where you might add something to your boot to create a little bit of um, extra grip to them. So like the, um, yeah, so something like the crampons or whatever. Um, you want to hinge at your hips when you're lifting that snow. So take that moment and really drive with the legs. So not feeling like it's your back that's doing that lifting. Take that time to step to turn rather than twisting through the spine. Take smaller loads in the shovels. So one strategy Sarah mentioned to me personally was she actually cut her shovel in half because she knows herself well enough that if the shovel's there, she's gonna fill it. So um, to take that time to either use a smaller shovel or come up with a strategy. So sometimes what I'll do is just make sure only half of my shovel is touching the snow, the other half doesn't have any snow on it. Um, don't hesitate to take breaks or share the load. This could become a fun family activity where you do a third of the driveway, your husband does a third of the driveway, <laughs> your kids do the next third, um, or recruit your neighbors. Just try not to make sure that you feel like you have to do the whole driveway all at once. And then as well, you can just push to clear the snow instead of lifting it. So there are other designed shovels. Sometimes the ones that have um, sort of that U-shaped handle are nice because they're easier to push, but they do have a massive bucket. So you might be caught up in filling that bucket a little bit more full. So see what works for you. Okay, so here's the video of me trying to correct my shoveling. So I take uh, less snow, take that moment, hip hinge, lift through my legs, taking that time to step to turn, face that snow pile and hip hinge. So one more time, just doing less snow there, taking that moment to hinge. And then I would have, again, taken a nice small, a few extra steps to turn before shoveling that snow away. All right, so we've gone through some specific examples for you. Of course, there are other ones, but we hope you take away the kind of general principles that we have as well. Um, so the just to kind of wrap up and summarize, the benefits of exercise for bone health are we want to try to prevent falls, we want to move safely, particularly to protect our spine, and uh, we want to think about preventing further bone loss. And remember, there's other components to your exercise program, it needs to be multi-components, so including strength and balance training is very important. Um, and thinking about those spine sparing strategies, we gave you, I think we said hip hinge about a hundred times today. It's probably one of the most important things you could learn how to do. Um, if you want to learn uh, and you need some specific advice, make sure you get that so that you understand exactly what to do and how to do it. And you can really use it every time you need to go back and forward throughout your daily life, putting on your shoes, picking up your laundry basket, getting things out of the dryer and putting them in the washing machine or vice versa, I guess. Um, but you can definitely use it throughout many, many, many daily activities, brushing your teeth, all sorts of things. Generally, when we're doing our exercise or when we're doing our, our winter activities, you want to think about the risk of falling um, and how you can try to prevent that and think about transitions. And we gave you some very specific tips for curling, snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, skating and downhill skiing, and our favorite winter activity of all, shoveling. Uh, I know I've, we've had lots of snow storms out here on the East Coast uh, this year, and uh, there's definitely times that I was shoveling way more snow than I should have in one uh, 
go. And I definitely paid for it the next day. So uh, making sure you take those tips that Tina just talked about. Sometimes it's just a mindset, stepping back, going slow, thinking it through, um, and then applying those spines varying strategies to those as well. So, wow, 445 or 345 right on the dot. <laughs> that was good timing. Uh, so we just want to uh, mention, uh, I mentioned BoneFit a couple times. Um, so you on the BoneFit website, bonefit.ca, um, you can actually find who's BoneFit trained around you. There's a locator map. So you basically just search your address or wherever you're, you're nearby, and it will actually show you who is bone fit trained near you, and then you could uh, connect with them that way. Um, so you can look on the website here, or you can call uh, the number. If there's no one around you, just uh, reach out to whoever you can. It's really important to try to connect with somebody who does have some training with osteoporosis um, as, as best as you can, but um, uh, see, see what you can do close to you. All right, so I think we're going to uh, spend some time answering some questions now that Carrie has for us. Yeah, well, thank you to all of you. That was great. There's so much information to think about. So as, as Caitlin said, we'll now turn to some questions and we'll try to squeeze as many in as we can. So I will ask the question and one of the panelists will answer. Um, does the activity chosen depend upon your fitness level? Yeah, so I'll, I'll ask that question. So I think uh, hopefully we've answered that a little bit. Um, we, we definitely want you to choose activities that, uh, especially if they have a higher risk for falling, that you are familiar with already and not necessarily take it up as a new activity. So um, it definitely depends on your fitness level, but also your awareness with the with the activity as well so if you already like tina i was talking about skiing um that is a really uh, uh it could be a really dangerous activity but it's something that she's very comfortable with and probably has a lot of skills on how not to fall i on the other hand have only been skiing once in my life and i would probably fall down the hill a million times. So it's definitely uh, about your familiarity level as well with the activity. Um, fitness level can definitely play into it as well. Um, you want to do something that you know you're safe doing, but you're comfortable doing as well. Um, and so that's where it'd be good to get some individualized advice of, of what's the best thing to kind of, if you're looking to start something new, what's the best thing to start that's new and safe for you? Okay. I think this one will be for Tina. Is it true that skiing downhill over a bump may have the potential for compressing the vertebrae of the spine? I certainly think that there is some component of risk as there is with uh, many sports and many activities that we do in our day-to-day -day that we have to be cautious about when considering somebody with osteoporosis. If you are at high risk of fracturing, um, certainly it, I can't say it's impossible. Um, if there isn't a whole lot of literature to support sort of any checking out those like adverse events. Um, that being said, we know that the spine is less loaded when we're standing than it is when we're sitting. Um, so as long as you're uh, absorbing some of the shock with your um, knees being bent and um, and sort of leaning into sort of your skiing, uh, I, I would suggest that it, it should be okay, especially if you are experienced with uh, with skiing. I would be more concerned about falling um, than I would be going over a bump. That being said, uh, I don't think this would be your time to take up moguls. So if you mean a bump like that, um, that that could be uh, quite intense and um, and repetitive. Um, but still, your meant to absorbs a lot of the shock with your knees too. So that helps to ease some of the load around the hips and the spine. And then the last sort of thought that I had related to a bump um, is making sure you're not trying to launch yourself off of any uh, jumps. So keep your skis on the ground. Um, I think even as a professional ski jumper or a ski trick maker uh, in, in your past, uh, when you have osteoporosis, that this is probably the time uh, to keep those skis flat on the ground. Great. Um, the next question I think is for Sarah. Um, what if you don't have a bench or a log available when you put your snowshoes on? 
Hmm, that's a bit of a challenge because the uh, to to like uh, putting on the skates in the video that uh, Tina was showing, hip hinge and, and spine sparing movements are really really important. Um, so I find a snowbank. <laughs> so that's what I do. If I'm out in the middle of nowhere and I'm going snowshoeing, I find I find a, a pile of snow to sit on because I have not successfully and I do have osteoporosis affecting my spine. I have not been able to put on my snowshoes unless I do an effective hip hinge and the best way to do that and reduce the risk for falling. So sometimes I'll just open up my car door and, and sit on sit on the ledge of my car door and sit there or sit on the bumper of my car and put them on there. So you gotta find something to sit on, whether it's a log, a bench, the bumper of your car, open up the panel, or me, it's just a pile of snow. <laughs> That's great, thank you. Um, is lifting heavy weights or impact sports like jogging better for bone density? Yeah, I can answer that one. Uh, thinking about kind of our general exercise recommendations. So definitely resistance training and balance training are really, really important to help prevent falls and they can prevent further loss of, of bone mineral density. Um, now with respect to lifting heavy weights, um, you want it to be challenging for sure. You just, but the most important thing, and I think we've probably said this a million times today is alignment. So you want it to be challenging, but you want it to be safe as well. So lifting a heavy weight improperly is going to uh, be very risky for you, but lifting a heavy weight, you know, that's an appropriate heavy weight for you is going to be helpful. So if you're unsure about alignment, you're not sure if you're doing it properly, then definitely get some advice on that. Um, but resistance training is definitely an important part of um, of your exercise routine as somebody with osteoporosis. In terms of uh, high impact running, I think was the other component there. Um, if running is something you've, I think, uh, again, we'll come back to the same message we've had for all our other activities. If running is something you've done and you're used to, um, then that might be something you could continue doing. I wouldn't suggest taking up running if it's something you've never done before and ever, you don't have, you know, expertise in. Um, there's a, a better things that you could be doing. So uh, that one's, again, kind of comes down to your level of experience with the activity. Okay. And Caitlin, I can add to that just to say that if you're going to lift a heavy weight as part of your exercise routine, have somebody witness and watch you do it so they can help you with your alignment. Because you may think you're aligned, but you're probably not. Yeah. So. Yeah, definitely, definitely get that advice about good alignment and, and what that means. Okay. Um, do any of you have advice about going tobogganing? Um, I can take that one. It sort of builds on my uh, initial thought with the skiing and hitting the bump, where the spine is less loaded in standing and maximally loaded in sitting. So I would say tobogganing is not the sport for you. I would avoid tobogganing. Uh, if you have osteoporosis, there's a high risk of uh, and that's where I could foresee a bump in the snow uh, being enough force to cause a, a spine fracture just because you don't have any padding or cushioning to uh, absorb that load. It's all going to go through the hip or the spine. Um, you know, there's probably a lower risk of falling because you're close to the ground. I just don't think it's the best sport. Uh, you can be the supervisor on your tobogganing trip. <laughs> and, and and a higher risk of crashing <laughs> yes. lower risk of falling but higher risk of crashing okay so. um, we have time, time for questions um how do you protect your knees while doing hip hinges we'd like to take that one I, I can start off and Tina and Sarah could jump in if, if you have other thoughts. Um, so really important is going to be alignment again. That's uh, our favorite word of today, I think. Uh, but thinking about uh, how your knees are moving while you bend. So making sure that they're not going out or going in so they're not kissing or going out to the side. You want them to be tracking kind of straight and straightforward as you can. Um, and then some people have uh, difficulty if they go really low 
um, like past a 90 degree bend, for example, they might just have difficulty getting back up and it might be a lot of stress on the knee. Um, so that might be, depending on your knees, that's something that you need to keep an eye on as well. So not bending down too low. Um, Another thing that can be really helpful is stick, taking a stride stance. So almost like a little bit of a, a, a lunge where you have one foot in front of the other and one foot kind of behind, not, not like on a line, but kind of striding, like you're taking a big long step um, and then bending that way. Sometimes that's a bit more comfortable than having your feet kind of right beside each other. And then thinking about the same principle. So think about your alignment, making sure that knee is not going in or out. It's going kind of straight up and down. Okay. I find one thing that really helps just to add on to that is using a dowel. And if you wanted more advice on that, look for somebody who's bone fit trained. It's a huge component of the workshop when we do train up other healthcare professionals. And I find that oftentimes that, um, remember that the hip hinge, you are allowing your torso to lean forward so you can keep your knees quite straight and not involved if you're using that hip hinge well. Uh, and the dowel can give you some feedback to make sure that you're doing that. And so sometimes people will do almost like a squat where they just lower themselves straight down. And although the spine is neutral in that position, it does put a lot of load on the knees. And that's where sometimes people confuse what the hip hinge is because they're trying to avoid a allowing their chest to fall um and and instead they're trying to keep themselves perfectly vertical but that that just ends up loading up the knees so uh, a bone fit trained professional will be able to teach you how to hip hinge well and uh, take a lot of the load off of the knees yeah just just to, just vision um somebody getting a golf ball out of a golf hole that, that that's not using a lot of knee bend and using a lot of hip hinge Okay, this will be our last question. Um, it's, it's been a frequent question. Um, is pickleball safe? I'm not sure who wants to take that one. Sarah, do you wanna take that one? Yeah, I, I, I play pickleball. It's one, it's one of my winter sports when I'm not outside. Um, yeah, it is safe. Um, basically because you can pace yourself. And you, as a, as a inexperienced pickleball player myself, I can let my crazy friends do all the hard stuff, but I can basically protect myself by doing that step two turn rather than the twist turn, right? And making sure that I'm using the hip hinge. Again, we're talking about alignment to, to uh, pick up the ball and, and uh, play with it. So it, I find it a safe sport. It bothers my knees actually more than it does anything else in terms of my spine and my hips and my bones. So it's, I find it more knee challenging than I do find it bone challenging. Yeah. The only thing I'll say too, and I will say I am not a pickleball player, but I do know when a competitive streak begins, people will sort of rush for a ball or really dive for it. This is your time to check your pride at the door. Um, so to not try to, to go for any crazy shots uh, if, or, uh, and, and super don't fall. That's, that's really important while playing pickleball, don't fall. Okay, that's great. Um, I want to thank our panel again um, for such an informative presentation on winter activities in bone. For more information on osteoporosis, please visit our website at osteoporosis.ca. You'll find many tools there, including um, a, a calcium calculator, uh, podcasts, um, we have a quiz, and we also have a repository of our past webinars. And this webinar will be available for viewing. Um, I'm not sure in the next 24 hours, I think. So again, thank you for joining us today and wishing everyone a great day. Thanks very much, everyone.